So welcome everybody today for part two in uh, in the series of Photoshop. Um, that is essentially going to be the last part of the digital editing, unless you guys all come with um, uh, questions, uh, ideas, things that you would like me to talk about. And if it's enough, then I'll make a I'll make a bigger piece of it. Um, but I find with these two sessions that we that we're doing now, um, I, I will give you the strongest starting point that you can have, and what you do with it after that is up to yourself. So the tools we're going to be discussing today, building on the tools of last week, um, and or last time, and um, and you will see that um, if you practice those things that we've practiced last time and this time. Um, you will be able to gather new techniques just by Googling them, and then you're going to be able to actually uh, bring them to life on your computer. Just a couple of words. Okay, all of you guys are repeaters, so I'm going to skip over insider divers, blah, 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 group trips. That's me. You guys know all that as well. Um, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, please do that. Just uh, trying to get to a thousand uh, subscribers, then I can get all kinds of cool tools and stuff. Um, so if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. And uh, otherwise, you can also share them. Obviously, tell your friends about it or your network um, it would really help me if uh, we had a few more um, subscribers. Um, I've done quite a few coachings now. Um, actually, uh, coaching, we did uh, a second session last week. Um, uh, that guy, Andrea, submitted his photos to a competition after we edited them together. And he's now in, this, in the uh, final round or in the second round, well, it is the final round, uh, semi-finals, they call them. So uh, it does help. So if you do want, just contact me. We can make uh, all kinds of uh, sessions, uh, either digital editing or portfolio discussion, uh, editing together, uh, or even uh, uh, photo setup. As you can see here, somebody, somebody had a new camera set up and we just went all through the camera setup via Zoom. So do contact me if you're keen on that, um, and then we can do that. Um, just for the session today, it is a meeting, so it's not a webinar. Um, that means you can come uh, alive. So we put your video in. Uh, audio on. Now, I would say for the sake of everybody else, keep your audio and video off for most of the time and use the chat to let me know if you uh, want me to uh, repeat or explain something in more detail. But because today it's possible, you can also turn on your audio and interrupt me because, you know, I'm going to be working with my two programs and I might not see the chat. So uh, in that case, you know, feel free just to turn on uh, your audio by unmuting yourself and then you can uh, interrupt me and just uh, ask me the question that you want, right? I'm also gonna try to leave time so you can try some of these things yourself. Although a few of the techniques that I'll bring out today are, they require a bit of practice. So it's better if you just use the handout and then just go through it step by step. But uh, I will let you try a few things. So do keep your Photoshop open um, and hopefully you already have a photo or two open in there that we can edit. So I call this today uh, masks, filters, and the high pass filter because that is the best filter of them all. Um, and you can see there in the corner that I'm also gonna add a twirl because twirl is kind of like a bit of a hype thing recently. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. And the main reason is I don't really want you to necessarily do all twirl, but um, it is, you will understand how to use it after the last session and this session. So um, that's why we're gonna do a little twirl at the end. Yeah. Um, so last time we uh, gave you a general orientation of the program. Uh, we talked about the tools that were available, particularly the spot healing and stamp tool. Uh, but we also talked about the layers and the masks and the adjustments that you can do. Today I'm going to build on these last three uh, a little bit more and add a few more tools. Um, a few people asked me uh, if uh, there were any handouts. Uh, that's very disappointing because I put the handouts online and I do send an email. So in case you do not know where that is, it's a kind of a hidden a page on Insider Divers, it's slash downloads, and you'll find here the last one is the part one handout, and there will be a part two handout as well um, in a couple of days once we're done with this webinar. Um, so what are we gonna do in detail today? Well, we're gonna uh, do a little bit more with the layers and the masks, and particularly gonna work a little bit more in detail with the tools on how you can use the tools to fine tune your image. And then we're gonna go into filters. There's different filters that you can use, particularly the ones that are useful for uh, reducing your backscatter. Um, but also we're gonna go into sharpening and high pass filtering, which are very, very useful. Um, I'm gonna show you how to record an action, which is very useful when you use these filters. Um, and at the end, we'll all twirl together. Um, so that is the plan for today. Um, this is my patient here. So um, this is a photo I took in Komodo two years ago. Um, and I was trying to do uh, slow exposure, but the best angle that I got uh, on the Nemo with the mouth open and the tongue eating parasite inside was unfortunately with 
uh, not only backscatter, but also the anemone in the back. So we're going to uh, practice today how you can isolate uh, and make a picture uh, like this. And at the end, uh, we're going to do uh, a bit of a twirl. Um, and that's probably going to look like this. So uh, I'm just going to go through a couple of things and then I'm going to show you in Photoshop. So um, the masking is a thing that you just need to practice a bit. Um, and um, I just want to talk a bit about how to actually select things and how to add to your selection once you have a selection. I'm going to introduce a new tool called the pen tool. Um, and then we'll play around with a brush adjustment and how to fine tune. So one more time, uh, just as a repetition, what are masks? Essentially, if you have different layers, like here you've got the bottom layer is the image, and then you've got two different layers on top. If you want to apply the effect that you have in that layer only to parts of your image, then you uh, put on a white mask. And uh, with the white mask, uh, you can still see all of the effect. But once you switch it to black, none of the effect is visible, and you can then brush with the brush tool in white color onto this black mask and the effect will appear only there where you paint this effect. Now, it's not super, super simple to understand, but once you play with it a little bit, um, um, then you will uh, see that it's uh, very easy to use actually. Um, you can adjust these layers inside that adjustment layer. Uh, you can also do that inside the mask itself and outside the mask. So we're going to play around with that a little bit in a moment. And also you can actually make the whole layer opaque. You can uh, decrease the opacity, which will decrease the amount of the effect. So very often I'll apply my different layers and then I'll start reducing the intensity by, um, by just uh, doing a little bit uh, of the effect by doing the opacity. Uh, one important tool that I would like you to practice uh, a bit more, and I'll tell you in a moment when to practice it, is the brush intensity. Uh, the brush intensity really allows you to do a good job or a poor job on your edits. Um, and uh, there are different ways on how you can do that. So here's a 100% brush. Um, that's how it basically is in the original mode. And here you can see it's feathered on the left, a little bit feathered in the middle, and not feathered at all on the right. So that is one way how you can change your brush tool, and I'll show you the shortcut uh, in a moment. But please use that so you don't always uh, go at it with the same size of brush tool. So uh, with Control, Option, and Drag to sideways, you can do this feathering, and up and down, you can do the size. It goes very quick once you get used to it. Um, and then the second option is you can reduce the opacity and the flow rate with the same steps for really, really fine tuning, just adding a little bit here and there. And so you can do both of these in Photoshop. So um, if we just open Photoshop and just do a new file, so you guys can all do this in a moment as well. So if you open just a new picture, that's just white, yeah? So I'm just gonna activate my little tool here so you can see which buttons I'm pressing. So I'm, this is my brush tool currently selected, yeah? You can see the size, I hope everybody can see it. It's currently very large. If I press Control Option and drag right and left, you can see the size is going up and down. And if I drag it up and down, you can see that it feathers or it doesn't feather. So I'm just gonna pick a color. There's the pink that I used just before. Let's just use blue, so it's a bit different. Oops, blue. Yeah. Now, if I did, oh, that turned out to be white, so blue, right? So if I'm going to make, oh, sorry, this is currently at opacity 50% and flow 50%. So now I have a fully feathered, um, a fully feathered uh, spot here. Now, if I then make this a hard brush by dragging down, you can now see I'm getting a circle. Obviously, that is a very rough tool. So if I want to apply an effect very fine, then you would want to make it a smaller circle with nicely feathered. And then you can see it still adds up being quite a thick effect. right? So that's why we would then apply the opacity and the flow rate to 50%. And now you can see I can actually add on top of each other. You see? So if I would take this circle here, for example, and I would want to make the sides a little bit softer, you can see I can add to finally getting 100%, but like this, I can fine tune the effect that I want to do. 
in a gradual form. Right? So I hope that makes uh, sense, but that is really, really useful. Make sure you always adjust your brush to the size that you need and the feathering that you need. Yeah? Mostly you want it highly feathers, so highly feather, feathered, right? So maximum feathers with this allows you to do much finer adjustments. Okay. Now, the other thing that I want to uh, give you as a little uh, uh, idea is to add a shortcut to add a mask or to add a black mask. That's just going to make your life so much easier. No idea why Photoshop doesn't do that automatically. And also no idea why they call it reveal all and hide all. I find that a bit misleading. But these are the uh, shortcuts that you need to create. So they're not automatically created. I'm going to show you in a moment where they are. Um, but I just add M for mask. That is a tool that I don't use otherwise. So the shortcut that has been used for that before, I don't use that much. So I just occupy it with this shortcut. And for a black mask, I do shift command M. And that means I can very quickly create a mask in Photoshop. Now, where do I find that? So I'm just going to go in Photoshop and show you where that is. So you're going to go up here um, to edit. Yeah. Oops. No, it's not edit. It's preferences. And preferences are in here. Sorry, just lost track of where I'm going here with this. By the keystrokes, keyboard shortcuts. Sorry, they are in edit. Okay, this magnifying thing doesn't work in. The drag down. So down here you see keyboard shortcuts. Once you go into the keyboard shortcuts, it's a bit hard to find. You go into layer, and you have to scroll down quite a bit until you come to this cryptic thing called reveal all. And there you click in, and then you can do any shortcut. But I like, uh, you know, M. So Command M for mask, right? And Shift Command M. These are originally not there. So once you add your shortcut. Um, if you use the ones that I've provided, they will tell you that there's another shortcut that is now being overwritten, and that's fine. You can always delete those again, but those other two, I don't find them very useful for underwater, so feel free to just use these if you want this shortcut, because now you can see when I'm on this layer here in the, in the right-hand corner, yeah. when I'm here in this corner, if I just want to add a mask, I just press... Oops, Command M, and then I get a white mask. Yeah? Or if I do Shift Command M, then I get a black mask, and the picture disappears. Yeah? So it's a useful tool, in my opinion, uh, to use. OK, then I'm going to go in a bit more detail in a moment about the uh, how to select items. You already practiced, I hope, with the Magic Selector tool, um, which does a really good job, but doesn't always work. So a very useful tool to play around with. Also remember that you can select the inverse, so you can select the subject and then uh, press uh, Command I, which sorry Shift Command I, which is a really important shortcut that will select the inverse and that will allow you to then paint on the outside of the image. Um, so make sure you remember those shortcuts and use them actively. Yeah. Now what you have in the image that we're going to use today, you'll see it's quite hard to sometimes, um, you know, for the selector tool to find the difference between the subject that you want to select and the actual background. So I'm going to introduce this new tool to you, which is a pen, called the pen tool. And the pen tool is actually what in the professional Photoshop editing for all the you know, magazines, the professional editors. So if you go on YouTube and you watch the tutorials, you see that they all use pen tools. And it's a lot of work. I don't recommend to use it all the time. But for certain situations, it's really good to know this tool. It is a bit painful to get used to. I find it extremely useful if you want to get a heart attack or a seizure. Uh, also to raise your blood pressure. It's a really, really great tool. Um, just kidding. It's, uh, it is annoying in the beginning. Um, so just practice it. Whenever you hit a roadblock, just Google your problem. And there will be somebody who explains that problem to you. Um, but I find it very useful once you know kind of how it works. It essentially allows you to do forms. Um, and there are these two handles at the end of the line that I'll, you'll see in a moment when I actually explain it. One is in charge of the direction. 
So the lower one is in charge of the, where the next line is gonna bend towards to, and the back is in charge of the curvature. So if you wanna make a round circle like this, you can see that this handle is pointing in that direction, so the curvature will continue in that way. But if you use the change direction tool uh, with Alt, so you can see now that this handle is pointing in the other direction, then you will get this weird bend because the line will first follow the direction of the handle. And so if you put your bottom, your next part here to the bottom, it will make this weird bend. Whereas this is actually meant if you want to make a sharp curve. So you can see the handle is pointing to the right. And so the line will start into that direction first. I'm sure this makes no sense to you right now. So I'm just going to uh, show you in a moment when we're in there. Right. Um, this is something that I'll put into the handout. Um, you just need to check if this is activated. I'll just put in the handout so you can do it. Um, so we won't do it now and waste time on this now. Right. Um, now, before I go and play around with it, I wanted to also mention that um, it's useful to save a good selection. So if you've done all this work in selecting your subject, which was a lot of work and you're really happy that you got this selection, make sure that you save it in save selection, which is in select, save and load selection in this area, you give it a name. And then when you later wanna select the same subject again, you still have that selection, you can make use of it. You can also use two tools to combine, so you can add to it. So if you had a magic brush tool first, you can use the pen tool to add to the selection. You see here, that's highlighted here, I'll show you how that works. But essentially, you can use two different tools to make one selection. Um, and that is quite a useful tip um, as well. So I'm just going to go into Photoshop um, right now. Oops, there we go. Actually, no, I'm going to, where's my patient? I'm going to pick up my patient here in Lightroom. So here we are in Lightroom. So this is unedited. This is how it came out of the camera. So I'm just going to white balance this here. I'm going to pick an area that's sort of white ish. Make sure my whites look white. And I'm normally I do a little bit of uh, uh, texture. I'm going to be very careful on what I'm doing here because we want to do this all in Photoshop. So I'm going to do mainly the white balancing. And now, as you remember, we do edit in, edit in Adobe Photoshop 2020, and I will open it in Photoshop. is working here a little bit. Okay, so now we have this image here. I hope everybody can see that. Yeah. Um, and the first thing we do, as you remember, is make a copy of the background. Command J. Oop, my thing is not activated. Okay, there we go. So Command J to make a copy. Yeah, so that means our background here is safe. It's anyway locked, but we never want to start with the background because if we change that, then that's no good, right? So now let's just uh, play with some of the selection, uh, or maybe I'm going to start one step back. So first, as a, repet a repetition, we've got these adjustments, right? So here are the adjustments. So if I click into here, you can see I'm opening an adjustment layer that has already a white mask. And if I do brightness down, you can see my entire picture gets bright or dark. Right. So now I could click into this mask and I could say, well, I don't want it on my clownfish. So if I press brush, so I'm now in my brush tool. Yeah, you remember this is our brush tool. I'm gonna go back to full flow rate and opacity. Now the effect is everywhere. So if I paint white on the clownfish, sorry, if I paint black on the clownfish, then it will take the effect away from my clownfish. As you can see now, I've painted this here, and if I do before and after, you can see I basically, the effect is only on the outside, right? Another way to do it is we're gonna apply our effect Make it a bit darker so it's a bit more obvious, right? On the entire image. And now we go onto the mask and we invert the mask. 
so the effect is gone yeah and now i'm the mask is black so if i want to see the effect i have to get use a white brush um, you can see here in the bottom right hand corner oops that's not working very well you can see these two little icons here right mm -hmm. and if you press x it will actually mm -hmm. switch those so this switch happens when you press x so if you're in a black mask and you have accidentally the black brush just press x and you get the white brush right so now i can just paint black into my picture here and that's another way of doing this right in both cases you can see that clearly i'm having a hard time getting close to my clownfish so it is not the ideal way of doing it. So I'm just going to undo this. We're going to do it in a different way. Right. So like I mentioned, we have the magic selector tool. You guys have hopefully all practiced with it. And it allows us to do relatively good selections, actually. Right. You can see here, it's doing quite a reasonable job in selecting The subject right but you can see that there's some parts missing on the outside that if i click on those it's gonna have a hard time identifying these you see because it's too close to the background so this is where the pen tool comes in the pen tool you can get with the letter p or just here on the left side yeah and we click on a starting point you can see this is a good surface to make a line with. So um, if you have a big bend like this, you make your first click and then you start dragging this uh, first handle and you can create a form. You can see, depending on how you move it, you can get different curvatures to match your line. Yeah. If you can't fully get it, you can adjust this uh, later or you can just delete and go to an earlier stop and then you just go along that line and every time you're going to drag and adjust so down here when you come to one of these is where you actually are going to have to move this handle with the alt button into this top direction because now you want to go change direction see i did a bit too much i'll do that so you can just click into that moved it a bit too far and that's how you essentially will go all around that thing and it will take quite a while i'm just going to do this a bit rougher now but you can imagine that you really need to want to do that like i will only usually do it for small parts of the animal but i'm just going to do this here now and i'm going to use the selector tool for the for the rest So just give me a moment while I'm doing that. I'm doing this very rough now, but you can imagine that you can do this very fine if you want to. And actually most professionals recommend that you use this this tool okay once you've made your ring now you click anywhere on there and you do right mouse click make selection alternatively you can also do this here in the top left hand corner there's also selection i usually do it on the right mouse click it will then give you a feather radius uh, which i usually keep at one but if you want it to be a bit more feathered you can go all the way to five and it now makes a selection so before I do anything else, I'm going to show you how to save this selection. So you're going to select, save selection, and then I just usually just put numbers in here. Okay, so now I've saved this one, nothing can happen. Now, if I wanted to add the rest of that fin by using the selector tool, so I use, let's just activate my little thing here again. I just press W or do the selector tool, 
And now I've got my selector tool. And as long as I've selected add to selection, it's this little plus button here, I can now actually, you see, just expand on this selection that I made earlier. So you can do this across tools that down here is exactly the reason why we wanted to use the pen tool, but I'm just gonna do it for simplicity's sake with the selector tool. But now I've selected this whole thing and I'm gonna do this again, just to make sure I'm gonna save this selection as well. Saved as a selection number two. And just to show you, if I wanted to go back to the other selection, I would go to select, load selection, and then I would go to one, and you can see it was the previous selection. If I want to deselect, I do Command D. And now if I wanted to go back to that, I will select it here, load selection two, and now I've got my selection. Now it's a few extra steps, but it is very useful to do because it's super annoying if you spend five minutes cutting out your subject and you make one mistake and then it's all gone, right? So therefore my recommendation is to load, save your selections. So now we've done this selection and you remember we wanted to make all the outside dark. So if we want to select the inverse, so shift command I, now we've selected the, now we've selected the, uh, my, there we go. Um, now we've selected everything that's not the subject. Yeah. And now if we use the brush tool to paint in the darkness, you can see we're just painting in the darkness on the outside of the animal. And you can do this with like a super huge brush because you're not doing any risk of painting inside your subject. So now I've painted darkness into everywhere in here. Yeah. And of course, this is still a bit rough, but at least I've painted it only next to my subject and not into my um, subject area. Now, if I deselect, if I deselect, no. Yeah. Now you can see, of course, this still looks pretty rough, right? But this is where you then would go into detail. And fine tune. So for example, yeah, you remember that there was the, uh, the, the shadow exposure is visible right here. So I would want to uh, a little bit of this effect actually visible. Oops. So I would go onto my white brush and just to be safe, I would put my opacity on 50% and my flow rate on 50% so that when I paint this in, it only comes back gradually. See, And I could do this everywhere where I feel like it's a bit too, you know, it's a bit too uh, extreme. You can see here everywhere it's a bit extreme looking. Yeah. And because I've got the brush tool set to this opacity level, it, it only adds. So I can just gradually increase on these areas. You can see here's an area where I've done, uh, clearly I made a mis the, the, the selection tool went too far. Here you can see as well, oops. So I switch back to black and I actually paint back in where I've not done a good job in, um, previously selecting this properly, right? So you can see how you can play with that and how you would just gradually um, increase and decrease the, uh, the selection around the animal once you've done the big step, yeah? So you can see I'm using X. That's why I'm using the shortcut because I'm going forwards and backwards between that effect and I'm going all around making sure that everywhere it looks kind of natural, right? So that was the one tool that I wanted to show you, um, which is the pen tool and in combination with the other one. Now you could say, well, this is still not very dark, very easy. We can just replicate this brightness and contrast. So if we copy it, so I've just pressed Command J to copy And now you can see it's pretty much all dark. Yeah. So a little bit rough around the edges. So um, yeah, just gonna, quickly finish up that job here. Oops. Just 
so it doesn't look too extreme when we do there we go okay it's not 100 percent, but obviously you would have to spend a little bit more time on that to do those details but now you've got the black background and you've got your animal selected if you do choose to not want to do that much you can go back into these layers and just you know reduce the amount of that or you can just take one of them away it's up to you that's the beauty about the layers is you can go back into them and change them later so this is uh from last time but let's say i'm going for this black look and i wanted to now get rid of some of my spot so i would now make a new layer and then now i could use my uh healing tool sorry so with j you get your healing tool and i could now just do these last remaining ones. Yeah, I could just get rid of these last remaining ones that, that we still have here. Even on the animal, we could now still do the last final ones and done. Yeah. So that's how you could create a black background relatively quick. Obviously, it's a bit extreme, but I just wanted to show how you can use these tools together to create, in this case, a black background. We're actually not going to be using that for um, the next step, but you can see that you can just make these invisible, as I just did here on the right-hand corner with the eye icon. Yeah, I just make these invisible, and I can bring them back later if I want to. We're going to do a couple of filters instead on this background. So before I continue to the next part, are there any questions? Sorry, I did turn off the chat. Are there any questions at this stage? You can also turn on your audio and ask. Yeah, Simon, this is Gerald speaking. Hi. Okay. I, I can see in your photo, you still have, um, it's, the, the black isn't really black. You, I, there are still patches, turn everything black. Okay, there is there are still uh, patches of um, um, really weird black uh, yeah. shadows. I, I had the same, same thing when I uh, edited my Blackwater photos, where I tried to do my black background really black. And then in the end, my end result ended up with, with dark spots um, on the oh. right hand side of just yeah. spear. So, so what you would do, yep. What you would do is you would do a test layer. So always before I finish with a photo, I will do a, a check layer, which is basically a brightness layer, and you just make it maximum, and then you can see your errors. And so on some people's computers, these errors will show up. Yeah. So I'm just gonna change this to like a check layer or something. Yeah. So this check layer shows me, aha, I've got problems. Yeah, so clearly I would have to do a better job in hiding these. So if I just take this away, it looks like it's gone, but they're visible on some computers, right? So one way you can do is just multiply this brightness and contrast. If I activate my check layer, you can see now, oh, this is, sorry, I, I did this a bit quick. That's because I did my, um, okay. Um, did you mean these, these uh, leftovers here? Yes, Zero? exactly. Yes. Okay. And sorry. Okay. We'll show in the in the end. Yeah. No. No. I'm sorry. I'll I'll do it correctly. Okay. So if uh, you've done because I did the the problem was I did the I did these um, texture corrections on the original uh, on on that first layer, right? But actually, I need to do the spot removal when I'm done. So I would do my I would multiply my brightness here. And then I would make a, I'm coming to that in the next section, but I would make a screenshot essentially of the final image here. So now this is a solid layer. I'll show you in a moment what the shortcut is, but now it doesn't matter what I do anymore because I've made a solid intermediate layer. Yeah. And now I would do, Now I would do my uh, spot healing on this one. And then you don't have this problem anymore. See what I mean? 
Because if you do your spot healing and later you change the brightness on these layers, the spot healing was made on what the layers were at the time when you did the spot healing. So this, the spot healing you actually have to do either before or after all of these brightness changes. Or, or you, you move do the layer like, down. You can move the layer down, right? Uh, well, the so if I if I if I press Alt, I can just isolate this layer, right? So you can see what I've just done, right? Um, and this is based on the brightness that we've created so far. So if you're going to change the brightness, it won't work anymore. Alternatively, what you can do, <clears throat> sorry. Alternatively, what you could do is you could do all your corrections here in the beginning then yes, all of these would be applied. So if I would put my layer down here, uh, sorry, and make a new layer in here. So let's say I do my spot removal here first, right? For example, these ones here, yeah? And then I do all my brightness afterwards, I don't have this problem, right? But if you do that, then you do all this work when you don't know yet which of these backscatters are still going to be there after you've done all your editing. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so what, what, what I usually will do, if I'm already in Photoshop, I will do all my corrections, and then I will do this solid layer, which is a copy of all of it, and then I will do the last final spots. Okay, okay then I have something else to add. Mm -hmm. um, that probably has nothing to do with uh, Photoshop itself, but once I have finished doing this, I then go back to Lightroom and then I um, save my, my photo as a JPEG. What that happens in the original JPEG that is then created is I have spots, weird spots. So, which don't appear either you in Lightroom it? or- You save it again. or you, you, sorry, you save it or you export it? Uh, ex sorry, export, yes. Yeah. When I export, I get weird artifacts. Yeah, weird. so um, the one ex uh, explanation for that is what RGBs you choose. The RGBs, if they don't match the RGBs that you've been using in here, that's one explanation. Um, the other is uh, if you're editing not on full screen, um, you often get artifacts that you wouldn't see if, oh, so once you put it, uh, once you export them, you will see them, but you wouldn't see them because your screen wasn't fully bright. So I always uh, try to edit at full maximum screen brightness, which reduces the amount of artifacts. But the other uh, reason for your spots should be um, the RGBs that you choose. So maybe try and export the same image where you have this problem with different RGBs, sRGB, Adobe RGB, Ardo uh, Adobe RGB 1998, and just see if you still get the same effect. Let's just take this offline. You can send me that, and I'm, I'll, I'll help you play with it. Yes, sorry, I was just uh, I was just off yeah. here. Continue. Any other questions on this, guys? I'm just going to continue to filters because we uh, I lost a bit of time with my with my computer problems. Um, we're now going to talk about filters, which is essentially the next dimension that you need to understand to get the full benefit of Photoshop. Filters uh, are essentially uh, solid layers that are meant to create certain effects. So here you can see I've created a motion blur effect out of backscatter. Um, and that is why Photoshop has all these effects. They also have them for things like twirl. There's all kinds of filters that you can use, but the ones that we're mostly interested in are the ones that we're gonna use for sharpness correction and, uh, and backscatter. Right? But these filters are essentially, and that's very important that you need to understand that, they're different from a mask because they are a solid layer, but they can be combined with a mask to be just used like a mask as well. So once you have one layer that is a filter, then you can put a mask on that and you can use it just like a mask, which means you can paint the effect that you're working with from the filter onto your picture and you can delete it from your picture. So you combine the filter with a mask and you get basically a special effect that you can brush into your picture. So 
very, very important to be able to do that, you need a solid layer. And that's what I was just using when I was uh, um, chatting with Jero is you need to create a solid starting point. It can't be one of the adjustment layers. It can't be one of the uh, 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 layers where you have your, your um, spot removals. It has to be a solid layer. You create that layer by merging your visible. And merging your visible essentially is a, is a bit weird concept, but um, you um, uh, essentially, I'll show you in a moment anyway, I find it hard to explain, but you basically, everything you see, you make one new image of it. And then you apply that filter to the solid layer, and now you've got your filtered layer, then you apply the mask to that filtered layer, and now you can brush your effect into your, um, into your picture. So this is the merge visible thing. I'm gonna tell you right away that the only smart way to do it is to use this weird four button uh, uh, shortcut, which is shift option command E. Yeah, that is um, merge visible without destroying your layers. Because for some reason, if you click merge visible, I'll show you in a moment, it actually doesn't do the same thing. It deletes all the, it, it merges all the layers into one and they're gone. But what we want is we want to flatten the images and then merge visible. So just try to remember these uh, shortcuts because that is the only way to do it actually really, really easily. You can also click uh, Alt, I think, or hold Alt while you click merge visible. But I'm telling you, as usual, I'm, I'm always thinking that the, um, the, uh, the shortcuts are the best way forward. Um, and then you add your uh, mask and then you just brush it just like before, just exactly the same, right? Uh, make sure you always do this off a separate layer that you don't need anymore. Because very often when you mess this up, you've messed up that layer permanently. And um, so you always wanna make it off a copy of your, uh, you don't wanna use your original layer. So there's different kinds of filters. I'm gonna show you two filters for backscatter, and I'm gonna show you one for noise filtering, and I'm gonna show you one for noise reduction. And Nigel here sent me an image, so I'm just gonna use, oh, I was gonna use this image, but now I don't dare open up Lightroom. Um, Nigel, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna use your image um, because I'm just a bit worried about opening Lightroom again. Maybe it's gonna hang my computer. If at the end I have time, I'll show it on your computer, okay? So, I'm just gonna show this first on this image here because the first one is actually uh, best to use on very fine backscatter. So I've just loaded my picture into here. You can see this came out of Lightroom like that. And you can see on the right-hand corner, there is backscatter, yeah? Also on the left-hand, there's a little bit of backscatter. And this is where you can use the Gaussian blur. The Gaussian blur is one of the filters that is actually most commonly used in Photoshop. Before I do any of that, I am going to create a copy of my layer. Oops, I'm not doing that. Okay. My mouse has just disappeared. Okay, Command J. So I've now created a copy of the layer. And just to be safe, I can also protect this bottom layer. So now, whatever I do to this layer, nothing can happen to the original image. Now, if I have created nothing else, I can just create a filter with this layer. So I would go on to filter, I would go into blur and create Gaussian blur. Now it gives you a little preview window here, which you can change. But what we really want is we want to see this area here where we have the backscatter, right? So we make a preview that shows us this backscatter, but actually if your computer is fast enough, surprisingly that the computer has no problem with, it will already give you a preview of what will happen to the image. And I'm not gonna go in detail, but essentially what you're creating is you're creating bokeh, uh, sorry, you're creating uh, artificial uh, lower depth of field. So the more you do, the more fuzzy the whole thing gets, right? You can see that's extreme. So it's as if you're widening the aperture, right? But you're doing it on the entire image for now. What we're interested in is the backscatter here in the, on the right and on the left. So we're gonna increase the radius, that's the, basically the size of pixels it will pick up until it covers, and you can see that these white dots start to disappear and fade. 
Of course, the whole image is affected now. But I'm still going to do it. So I'm going to press OK. And now the whole image is affected. Because we've got the two layers, you can see when I click it, it just disappears again. Right? So I have now created this filter. And now we're going to use this shortcut that I mentioned earlier, which is creating a mask. So if I do uh, a white mask, which my command is command M, then you can see that I've got a white mask and I can now brush in black. But we only want to apply this effect on a certain area. So I'm going to do a black mask. I'm going to go into my brush tool. And because it's a black mask, I'm going to paint white into it. And now you can see how I am just painting the backscatter away. Right. Now, this is a bit of a crude way of doing it, but essentially you can see how quickly I can fix backscatter in a very rough way. Now, a trained eye will see this immediately, but my mother wouldn't notice it. So it is a way to quickly fix backscatter and the rest of the image is fine. So here I can create this whole area, just so you can see this before and after, right? If you look at this area here, this is a mess. You cannot clean this up with uh, Spot Heal, but you can create this whole area. And so now we're of course affecting some of the fish. So that's something we would have to fix, but we can clean up this whole area. Another option that we have is we can now, if we find this effect too extreme, we can change the opacity of this layer. So you see this layer here has its own opacity. And if I just drag here to the right, you can see that the layer becomes that was a bit too much. It just reduces it a little bit, right? And now we've, oops. We've reduced the backscatter in this area without having to do too much other work. Yeah. So like I said, it's a bit of a crude way. You would now have to spend time to clean it up, right? How could you clean it up? Well, you would go into your mask and you would switch back to black, right? And now you would try and get these fish back out. If you have a nicely feathered brush, right? You will see that you can just click onto the individual fish and it actually does a pretty reasonable job. Just getting these individual fish to come back out. I'm just doing a few here. Let's do this. Right? So now when you zoom back out, you can see that this looks pretty good. Now you could also like maybe here, clean up this area where it's going a bit too far here as well. Right? And so you've care taken care of a, a pretty nasty area with relatively few clicks. Yeah. So that is the easiest filter. Let's go for a bit stronger filter. So that was the one we just did. Yeah, you can play with the opacity, but let's go to a more extreme one, which is actually much more, much more powerful, which is the dust and scratch filter. Okay, I'm gonna use now our patient, which is the round fish. I'm gonna delete or not delete, hide all these effects that we've done. I'm just gonna put them all into a, um, into a group. And I'm going to put it away so now it doesn't bother us anymore. Yeah. Okay. So, first of all, I want to show the effect that if we are doing it when we are using multiple layers before we use the filter. So, let's say I'm creating a, uh, a layer to um, get rid of some of the um, backscatter that's right on the animal. So, let's say I did a couple of these. Yeah, a couple of those. Yeah, um, and let's say I did some uh, adjustment layer, um, reducing the brightness here in the middle. Oops. 
Oops. Okay. All right. So now you can see on the right side, guys, you can see that I've done two layers, right? Above my photo layer. Now you cannot apply a filter on a non-solid layer. So we need to create a solid layer. As I mentioned before, you can use either, you can mark them all and you do right mouse click and then you go to merge visible. Now watch what happens when you do that. It just makes one layer out of it. It combines it all into one. Sorry, I don't know why it deleted our group here. Oh, because it was visible, yeah. Oops. So by clicking merge visible, it actually makes it all into one image. And so we cannot later separate these effects anymore. So we don't want to do that. So if you hold option, uh, Alt while clicking Merge Visible, then it will create a copy of everything that we're looking at, but the three layers remain intact. So you have to press Alt to while you're clicking it. But much easier, instead of any clicking, you just do Shift Option Command E, and it does the same thing. So if you see here on the right side, we now have a separate image. We could get rid of these layers. We could make them invisible. Doesn't matter because we've got a solid layer on the top. So now we're going to apply one of the other filters onto this, um, onto this solid image. And the one I want to use is dust and scratches because it's literally made to remove dust and scratches that you have on your sensor or on your lens. Sorry, did I see there was a question just popped up or? Yeah, Roberto, you can also do it that way. There's multiple ways to roam in Photoshop. So there's different ways of doing it, but you're right. You can also do it like that. Um, so now I'm doing dust and scratches and you see I've already played with it a bit. I'm just gonna put the radius to zero you can see all of my backscatter is there. So with the radius, you're deciding on the size of element that you want to be picked up by this filter. So if I go to 13, you can see a lot of, even the long streaks start disappearing. But of course, also the picture quality starts uh, getting worse. But you can see that it does quite a good job in deleting some of these trails. You can increase the threshold as well which uh, essentially makes the, uh, it picks up finer, um, uh, finer and less finer details. Okay, my computer is again struggling a bit with this. Just gonna leave it at this so we don't hang up again. When you press okay, You can now see it's done quite a lot of the dust and scratch. It's removed quite a lot of these uh, scratches that we had before, quite long trails um, that it deleted with that. Some of them a really good job and others not so much. So you can play around with that, but now we would of course have to uh, get our subject here in the middle, not, you see we lose the detail on our subject as well, yeah? So fortunately, we, uh, so we're first gonna create a black mask, or actually a white mask on this one, yeah. And now we want to get our clownfish cleaned up. So we would go into, oops. We would load, oops, I'm in the wrong image. We would load our selection from earlier. You remember that the second one was the one that had our clownfish nicely covered. And now you can see the selection is really useful that we saved it. Now, if I took my brush tool and I paint black into here, you can see that I'm now basically taking the effect away from anything but the clownfish. And so now when you see, when you look at the effect that we've done, you can now, see that the effect has only been applied outside of the clownfish. 
Okay, so this is how you can make use of the masking together with a filter to get rid of uh, this kind of uh, back backscatter. But as you can see, we still have uh, you know quite a lot of uh, stuff in here. So it would make sense to actually create a Gaussian filter based on this. So if I'm going to do just the same thing again, I'm going to make another filter, sorry, another solid layer. I'm going to go into my blur filter, do another Gaussian filter. Just blur to the degree that, you know, that annoying stuff is gone. Like this, for example. Again, I'm going to create my mask. Again, I'm going to load my selection. And again, I'm going to paint into the selection so that the effect doesn't apply to the clownfish. And now when you look out, you can see the before and after. You can see that all this nasty backscatter that we had before is now mostly invisible. Right? And so this is how you can make use of uh, dust and scratch removal. Of course, there are some things that need to be still done. Um, you can see now here, for example, there's still some backscatter there, but very easy. You just create a new layer, sorry, create a new layer. And now you can do some spot removal on these layers. Just whatever is left over after you have done your uh, the application of your filters. Okay. Now I'm going to go to sharpening. Are there uh, questions on this? Obviously, there are many other uh, ways of doing the uh, backscatter removal. I'm just showing a couple. There are more, but these I find the most uh, useful ones, ones anyway. Um, before I go to sharpening, uh, are there any questions on this? Okay, I guess no. So the next thing we're going to do is a uh, shake reduction filter. So this helps us. This image, you can see that we, uh, you know, obviously had a shake because this was a slow shutter picture. So essentially, uh, there's a lot of sharpness that has disappeared. Let's see how we can bring this uh, uh, sharpness back. So again, I'm going to create a solid layer. And now I'm going to do uh, one of the sharpening filters. And there are different ones. Uh, one very useful one is shake reduction. So this is uh, obviously made for more like uh, sports photography, animal photography in particular, uh, where you know the, uh, the capture uh, of the animal is slightly unsharp because of the movement of the animal or the movement of the camera. So with this tool, the shake reduction tool, you can um, essentially get a uh, sharpening where the Photoshop program tries to imitate the shake that has created this roughness. So you can create an area. I don't know why it's not doing this now. Okay. Um, you can pick an area where it will detect this motion blur. And here in the faces where we want the sharpness to come back, and the settings that you see here are the standard settings. So you can do more or less blur and trace browns, the smoothing and the artifact suppression. This is how it, um, the program suggests you start with. And I would not deviate too much from it, but you can. But if I start doing that, it will, it will calculate a lot. So I'm just going to use this one for now. It will already have to calculate quite a bit. And now it will have applied sharpness to this layer. So if we go into detail, Right, you can now see that the teeth, for example, are much sharper now. Also, the face of the uh, tongue eating parasite is much sharper now. Yeah, so uh, you can do several of these, um, but what we would do again is we would uh, mask this. Now we would mask this with a black mask, and we would just paint 
the details in where we want them because we can see that um, oops we can see that adding this actually is also creating quite a lot of noise that we don't want so we would just paint in these details where we want the details to be Right, and you could go and, and detail it out wherever you want those details to be seen. Yeah. So just to do the comparison, maybe I should have taken a bit more extreme example, but essentially you can see that there's a bit of sharpening going on. So um, just because of the, we're already over uh, one hour and I still have quite a few things to do, I'm just going to go to the next filter right away. The next filter is uh, basically correcting some of these noise problems that we create with the different sharpnesses. So similar thing, we're going to do a solid layer again. You already see how this is going. Now, if we want to get rid of the noise, we go to noise, reduce noise. And basically what we're getting rid of here is the luminance noise. So we have to just pick the area where we actually are interested in, right? So you can see we've got quite some pixelation here in the fins. Um, and you can play around with this however strong you want it to be. I'm just going to do it a bit, bit stronger so you can see the effect. I really have to apologize, guys. I had no idea that my computer is going to struggle so much with Zoom and this at the same time. Okay, so now we have reduced the noise. You can see when we untick this, if you look at, for example, here in, the, in this area, you can really see the pixelation quite dramatically. And with the filter applied, you can see that it's dramatically reduced. So obviously, we would now have to selectively, oops, we would have to selectively um, apply this effect where we want because obviously we wouldn't want to reduce the details of the eyes so we would just paint this wherever we find this noise particularly uh, not handy so for example here you could do it in between the uh, the fin elements or here this top area wherever you find it particularly annoying you would now apply this noise effect. And if we can do before and after, that's a bit hard to tell in this resolution, but essentially that is how you can reduce noise as an additional filter. Okay, is that so far uh, clear? Then I will go to the next one. The next one is a much larger one. So this is called the high pass filter. And um, this is actually a very heavily used feature in professional photography. Uh, what it does, it is a way to soften uh, your details or sharpen, and that's what we're most interested in, sharpen your details. Um, and it also increases the contrast of the details. Essentially it does what texture and clarity do in Lightroom already, um, but it does it um, uh, in, in a more refined way. So here's an example of a picture that I took in um, that I took in Kenya this year, um, and you can see the detail of the shot of the line is pretty good. But when I apply the high pass filter, you can see that the details increase dramatically. So here, if you look on the eye on the one side and the eye on the other side, you can see there's a lot more structure in it. You can also see the hair above has much, much more detail than it has on the original image. Now that's not always what we want, and so we're going to apply it only where we want it to be, um, and that is essentially the beauty of this thing. Now, it, this is a bit tougher thing to set up. I am going to talk you through it, but I'm going to show you a little bit later on how to actually set it up so that you can use it on your computer. Because unfortunately, it's not just a filter. Here's an example where, for example, on shark, uh, the, the ampullae of Lorenzini on the shark details, it makes a huge difference on how crisp an image looks. 
if you use it smartly. So um, that is a, a very, very useful tool. And you just need to um, know the trick on how to set it up as an action. And then it's very simple to use. So even on humans, can, you can see that here in the beard, but also in the eye details, um, uh, also the brightness of the uh, regulator, how the regulator shines in metal, all of this is very, very useful uh, when you use a high pass filter. So this is actually the best way to sharpen your images. It is maybe the longest way because you have to put it into Photoshop and you have to do this, but for uh, pictures that you uh, really want to have in a perfect condition or that you want to submit to competitions, it might be useful to use a high pass filter. Use it carefully because if you use it too much, people will notice it and then it might get disqualified in competitions. Right? So before I show you how to set it up, I'm just going to show you how we're, what the effect is, and then I'm going to show you how to set it up. So uh, we've done all this stuff here, right? And I've already recorded an action. You can see this is an action, and these are the steps. I'll show you in a moment how to get these steps done. But if I now apply this high pass filter, it'll be doing a little bit of stuff. I can select the amount of high pass detail that I want to use. Something between 25 and 35 is usually good. And now at first we see nothing happens, right? Because there's a black mask already in place. But watch what happens when I use my brush and I paint white. I'm going to go in a little bit more detail. Watch what happens when I paint into the picture here. See how these eyes get much darker and much crisper? But even here in the middle of the face, you can suddenly get a lot of texture of the skin back. I don't know if this is visible to you. For me, it's very obvious here on my screen. I'm just gonna do a little bit more so you can see the comparison. So if I undo this, can you guys see that? Huge difference on all details. I'm going to paint this a little bit more. Okay. Huge difference on all details. Um, I could do another one. So if I do the first one I did with 20%, sorry, 20 pixel radius, now I'll do one with 37. So that essentially lets other details come to light once you brush into those. Look what happens with the eyes. Okay. Or here the teeth, or this. All right, so let's just do a before and after. I'm gonna take this away. I'm gonna add this back in. So, I'm going to come to your questions in a moment, guys. Yeah. Um, so you can see how much we can get back once we use the high pass filter on these elements. Right? You can also see how it is quite easy to make it a bit too dark. So the blackness that you get is quite extreme. So to fine tune, you could now reduce the opacity of this filter to make this effect a bit softer of this second one. And now you get a quite a nice result. So if we compare our clownfish subject here from before. This was the original, and that is where we are now. Much sexier. Um, now to answer your questions, guys. So Virginia, good question. Do I still use texture and clarity? If I plan to use Photoshop, then I will only use a tiny bit of texture or none. Uh, I do find texture is still really, really good to use for underwater, but if you're going to apply uh, high pass, you need to be careful that it doesn't get too grainy. Yeah, so uh, just you need to play with that a little bit. Um, like I mentioned before, I only put a a small number of photos actually into Photoshop because it's so much work. So only really important pictures I would put into Photoshop, and so I might actually take out the texture and the clarity and a lot of the other edits, and then bring it into Photoshop and first do what I want to do in Photoshop before bringing it back into Lightroom. Um, for uh, the question that Wetter uh, is asking, if you have an unfocused photo, you can get a lot back if you use a high pass filter. 
But before you use high pass filter, I suggest that you use the uh, uh, shake reduction. So for unfocused pictures, unshake, uh, the shake reduction filter does quite a lot of things uh, for you. So I strongly recommend doing that first and then adding. But you can see that you can stack them on top of each other and, practice and play around with them and see which one gives you the better effects, right? So that's what you would have for unfocused. Okay, um, so how do we set one of these guys up? Well, it's uh, the easiest way is to do it as an action. You saw I just clicked on this action. So here in this, you can see here this panel, which is the actions, yeah? And you can see I have quite a few that I've done over the years. Like if I wanted to do to put this all into sepia, I just press this uh, button. Uh, I've used this one in a while, so I'm not sure this actually still works. But essentially, actions are doing a whole lot of steps for you. Yeah, I'm just going to undo this one. Okay. Um, and you don't have to do all the individual steps. So if we look at our high pass filter, you can see that there's quite a few steps involved. Yeah, and these steps you have to record one time in the right order. So I'm going to show you how to do it, but I suggest you just do this based on the download that I'm going to send you later because it is quite a few steps. Yeah, so you would go down here in the bottom right hand corner and you would create a new action. And now you can see. Oh. Where'd it go? Oh, oh, where did my action go? There we go. So you can see now here that there is a record button, which means everything I do from now on will be recorded. So first I would create a solid layer. Then I go to my filters and I go to other, I click high pass, that is this filter. And it doesn't matter what you do this time because you can change this later. So that's just this while you're recording it, but actually you can change those values later. So now I'm creating this and you can see this picture looks weird. This is the high pass filter. It's letting certain details through and others it doesn't. Um, um, now we need to make a very weird step, which is overlaying this. So we're basically creating a sort of a, um, yeah, like a, a mask that is semi-transparent. So now it's in overlay mode. And now we would mask it. And that's when we would stop our recording. You can also press brush so that you're also automatically selecting the brush tool with your action. So that means you're doing all of this and at the end you have a mask and you have your brush tool already selected. Now you would press stop and now all of these steps would be recorded in your high pass filter. Another thing that's important, okay, I don't know why it doesn't let me do that. I'm just gonna put this back into here. Let me see if it doesn't let me do this. So one thing that's very important, and I'm gonna put this into the handout, is you have to activate this button. If you don't activate this button, it will not let you choose the value of your high pass filter. I know this sounds really confusing now, but you will get it once you play with it. Um, if you don't have this, then it will not let, let you select a value. Okay. Um, so if I just undid this and I would just use this high pass filter, if I tick this off and I let this thing run, it will just use the high pass filter value that I used earlier, which was 37 or something. Whereas if I tick this little button here and then let it run, then it will actually ask me what level of high pass filter do I want to use? And then it will do the rest of the action. So you can even do this with many different steps. I'll try it later with twirl because twirl runs through a lot of these, um, but essentially, it gives you the option of uh, changing a few of
Apologies. Really a good technology day today. Okay, so I'm not going to go through this in more detail just because it takes this much time. But essentially, now you've seen how you can use the high pass filter. Okay, this looks a bit horrible now. I'm just going to delete some of these because we did too many of these. Okay. Um, but essentially, um, that is how you use the high pass filter. And that is how all filters work. Now, what's really, really important is that once you practice this, and you can get this in your head, you can actually use all filters that you can see in anywhere in the internet. So you see something interesting, you just need to find the name and you can just say how to do this in Photoshop. And with applying filters and masks, as we've practiced it now, you actually can do all of this uh, yourself. It is all that you need to understand is how masks and filters work and how you manipulate them. And if you practice this, then you will be able to do all of these effects, including the twirl, um, all by yourself. So uh, my suggestion is to, uh, and I'll try to put some uh, homework type things, some exercises into the handout so that you can practice uh, using these filters. And the easiest is just to try getting rid of your backscatter and sharpening, like what I was saying earlier, sharpening his images. Try to do those um, uh, and to get a hang of how to use filters and masks together. Okay, so just to finalize this, let's twirl. So you can do uh, twirl in all kinds of uh, different variations. It's been quite popular. I am not sure that that is necessarily a super important thing, but I think it's a great way to show what you can do with Photoshop um, if you just understand how these uh, filters work. Um, it works particularly well if you have different um, colors in one image, um, and it's a great practice for getting used to filters. So it makes use it makes sense to try and do a couple of twirls. It's kind of fun what comes out of it, but it doesn't look like underwater anymore. Um, you can definitely not use it for competition, so don't think that you can use this in like the creative section. It's totally uh, uh, not allowed and is way too far away from the original image. Um, and lots of people find it boring, so don't keep posting this on the internet. People are going to find you uh, a bit annoying. But just play with it for fun. It's kind of a fun effect. It's kind of fun to see what happens. Here are the steps. So you can see it's quite a lot of steps, but essentially you're putting five filters on top of each other um, and then you blend them together. So here's an example of uh, a picture from Roger Ampad, uh, which has you know nice blue and yellow, so different colors. And then you would do uh, first a smaller version of this image so that it's not so heavy. So you would reduce it by, in this case, I just did 30%. Just make a smaller JPEG of it so it's not such a huge file. So it goes from 260 to 23 megabits. And that's going to make your computer work less hard on it. Then you do different filters on top of each other. So the first one is the mesotint with long strokes. Then you put a radial filter onto that, which is like one of these zoom filters. And then you do another one of those and you do another one of those. And so they just keep adding up on top of each other. And then once you've got that, this is what it looks like. And then you can add the twirl effect. So this is another filter where you can create a sort of a twist effect. And then you do the same thing and you do the twist in the other direction. And then you layer them on top of each other with one of these, uh, what we used earlier, this uh, uh, blending technique. And then you get this effect. So I am going to try to do this with our image, but I'm not sure my computer is going to hang up. So if it does, I apologize in advance and I'll see you afterwards. But essentially, that is how you can create it. And I didn't actually try doing this yet with our clownfish, so I'm just gonna try doing it with our clownfish. So how can we do this? So we would do, again, a solid layer, but this is a huge file now, right? So this is currently 1.4 gigabyte heavy, so we don't wanna use this. But this front layer, right, is a, is a picture in itself. So, oops. No, I did the bullshit. Sorry about that. There we go. Um, now I would make a new uh, picture. So let's say this is a much smaller size, just 1,200 by 800. Yeah. So you can see this is now my 
a new file in Photoshop. I go back into here. I just drag this over. Okay, so it's a lot larger, so I have to resize it to fit. Yeah. So now I've put it into here and now it's a lot smaller. And instead of going through all the steps, I actually recorded the twirl earlier. So if I now just go on this twirl and let it do its magic. Let's see what actually happens because I didn't try this on this image. So there we go. Now we've got uh, two different ones layered on top of each other already. And now you could play with the opacity and you could do more or less of that. Make this more opaque. And you can play with all kinds of variations. So you can do this. You could, uh, you know, you could go through all the different blending ways, how they overlayer with each other. I think a red and black was maybe not the best one to play with. Like if you did it on on uh, anyone with lots of colors, then you get these these steps. If you look in the action here, you can see how many steps are necessary in that. Um, yeah, so when you export it, um, yes, you can either take a snapshot of this and bring it back into your original image. You can also, because these are smart filters, you can actually bring this back into your original image and export it from here if you wanted to. So you could do that. Oh, my computer is going to struggle with that a little bit. Or you can just export it from that new one. Uh, I was worried about that. <laughs> I think Photoshop's going to work here a little bit. Um, so, yeah, that's essentially uh, how you do it. I'll put this all in there. You can play around with it, like cutting out parts of it and then bringing the original image back. So you can play around with that. So you can knock yourself out. Uh, like I said, it's just a way to play with these filters and learn how they work for you. So um, that was it, what I wanted to share today um, in this second part. I hope you liked it. We talked about masking, the pen tool, and then the pen tool ruined my computer. Sorry about that. Um, then we talked a lot about filters and the uh, prime one being the high-pass filter. Um, I did show you how to record an action, although we didn't spend that much time. So just try to do that. It's quite self-explanatory. Um, and um, just try it. And the twirl will also be in the handout, so you can just give it a go and play with it. Um, most importantly, guys, um, uh, make sure you join our next talk, which is uh, Richard Barnton, uh, um, Underwater Photographer of the Year last year, won the most prestigious award with uh, a spawning photo, and he's going to talk about all the spawns in Palau. That, that's where he's been living for 16 years. Uh, one of the biggest photographers of our time is coming to spend the time to talk to us, so please join on that on Thursday. Um, he will uh, not talk about editing, just about photography, but uh, yeah, make sure you join that. Also, I'm going to do another macro talk uh, in a little bit. Um, so that's going to be the second macro talk, uh, which is, uh, I don't remember when, in two weeks, I think. Um, so make sure you join for that one, or next week, I think, um, um, where we're going to talk about snoot photography, backlighting, black water, and such things. Uh, also, I just want to mention, I haven't made the poster yet, but we've got Alan Walker, which is a famous uh, shark photographer from South Africa, who's going to do a talk in a couple of weeks. And also Mark Erdman from Conservation International is going to talk about uh, whale shark tracking and uh, walking sharks and stuff like that. Um, so uh, make sure you keep track of our webinars that are always on insidedivers.com slash academy. And um, because this is the last one of my digital session, I wanted to ask you guys if you would be open to going on to my new Facebook uh, photo page, I'll drop the link into the chat. Um, it's basically uh, where I'm going to put all my photos from now on, just because my Facebook is actually uh, running full. So I'm, um, yeah, I'm not sure what, what's happened here. My computer is really not my fan. Uh, I'm going to send this thing later, but essentially it's Simon Photo, underwater photography by myself. And if you could review um, the coaching that I've given you here on these different Lightroom and Photoshop sessions, that would be really appreciated. So if you could just say what you uh, 
learned or if you uh, enjoyed your time uh, and if it's helped you with your photography, something like that, that'd be great. So there you can find it. And if you want, you can do a, a review there. If you wanna support my work, I think uh, some of you have already done that. You can uh, donate some money, uh, even 10 bucks if you like, um, if you feel um, you've got some value out of it. But you can also just uh, write a review that's uh, also worth a lot to me or recommend me to your friends or your dive community. So that would also help a lot. Um, you know that Insider Divers can be found on all these different social media channels. Also, if you're not yet part of the Insider Divers community, that's a really good place where we exchange knowledge and fun stuff. So uh, you can also join there as a member. And with that, um, I don't know if there's any questions or anything that anybody wants to share. Um, otherwise, I would close the meeting at this stage. Mm -hmm.